Welcome, everybody. So my name is Hugo Bellin. I'm the immediate past president of the Genetic Society of America, and I thank you for joining us for penultimate GSA awards seminar. Today's speaker is Shirley Tillman, recipient of the 2022 George Beadle Award. And the award recognizes her outstanding contributions to the genetics community and society and her service on the National Advisory Council for the Human Genome Project Initiative. She's been recognized for her advocacy for transparent, equitable policies, openness in data sharing, and public available databases, as well as sustainable funding policies. The award also recognizes her pioneering contribution to mammalian imprinting. First, a few words about her research. Shirley's research career has focused on mechanisms underlying mammalian development. She adopted methods to manipulate the mouse genome at will and performed sophisticated in vivo experiments defining the temporal and spatial regulation of genes. Her group identified the non-coding H19 gene and showed that H19 is an imprinted gene that is exclusively expressed from the maternally inherited chromosome. Her laboratory went on to elucidate the basic mechanisms through which genomic imprinting is regulated. In addition to her contributions to science, Shirley has significantly impacted the larger scientific community. She helped envision the US effort in the Human Genome Project. Subsequently, she served as the founding member of the National Advisory Council of the Human Genome Project Initiative which had a major impact on genetics research by providing publicly available genome sequences. She also shared the National Academies Committee that made recommendations regarding intellectual property in genome research. Shirley also championed diversifying the academy at all levels. The first task force she appointed <clears throat> as, principal, as Princeton's president sought to provide equity in faculty resources. As a trustee of the leadership enterprise for a diverse America, she supports underserved high school juniors to succeed in highly selective colleges. And she has a steady fast commitment to promoting young scientists and sustainable funding. As a result of her groundbreaking research and staunch commitment to an equitable and diverse scientific community, Shirley was awarded the 2022 George Beadle Award. We're fortunate that she's here with us today to discuss her work and advocacy work in more detail. Finally, before we start, I have two quick housekeeping uh, items. The first is that all GSA online events are covered by our code of conduct, and you can find that link for that in the chat box. The second is to remind you about our question and answer session, which Shirley <clears throat> will be glad to talk about after the talk. So please drop any questions you have in the chat box and we will get to it as, to as many as possible at the end of our seminar. Shirley, welcome, please take it away. Thank you, Hugo. Um, so let me begin by saying uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be at the moment. I was going to start by saying that it seems strange to be talking to people in so many different places, but actually it's sadly come to feel quite normal. I am uh, very grateful to the Genetic Society of America for honoring me with the 2022 George W. Beadle Award and for inviting me to give this webinar today. The list of prior recipients of the award is an amazing constellation of scientific leaders. Many I'm happy to call my friends, and I'm humbled to be included in their company. Adding to my humility is the responsibility of having my name associated with George Beadle, who was a towering figure in 20th century genetics and coincidentally a fellow university president. But first I wanna take the opportunity to thank two wonderful former trustees, Marisa Bartolome at the University of Pennsylvania and Tamara Caspery at Emory, who nominated me for this award. So in adopting for my title, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste lessons for science from the global pandemic, I'm revealing my generally optimistic view of the world. 
Surely something good must come from the last two years in which we have been challenged as never before to sustain the quality and the impact of the science we do. I find it ironic that in February of 2020, the National Academies held a gathering in Washington to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the publication of Vannevar Bush's seminal report delivered to President Harry Truman at the end of the Second World War entitled Science, the Endless Frontier, which laid out the blueprint for the US government's future investment in science and technology. Over the years, whenever I need inspiration, I reread this, his extraordinarily influential report. And I'm always struck that Bush's vision of science as an ecosystem in which the government takes on primary responsibility for funding fundamental discovery, and in so doing feeds the private sector's capacity to turn that knowledge into products that benefit society remains valid today and has served the country and the world remarkably well. His emphatic defense of the importance of curiosity-driven fundamental research has, in my view, been one of the reasons for the dominance of the United States in science and technology over the last 70 years. On the other hand, the anniversary stimulated a lot of questions as to whether Bush's vision was still relevant in the 21st century, and if not, what adjustments to this blueprint need to be made? What aspects of our scientific enterprise are working well and what are in need of reform? But unbeknownst to us at that meeting, SARS-CoV-2 had already found its way to our shores. And suddenly the scientific community was confronted with the completely unprecedented twin imperatives of protecting scientific productivity and the careers of young scientists just establishing their reputations while at the same time mobilizing to get us through a global pandemic as quickly as possible with effective public health measures, therapies, and vaccines. Lockdown was followed almost immediately with the killing of George Floyd, reigniting the Black Lives Matter movement and catalyzing a great national awakening to the realities of systemic racism that has left no one untouched including, of course, scientists and physicians. It is the intersection of these events that interest me. For as the Stanford economist Paul Romer said in reference to the 2008 Great Recession, a crisis, in this case, two crises, is a terrible thing to waste. Of course, these are not completely unrelated crises. The SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has held up a mirror to all of us bringing into stark relief the shocking inequities in rates of infection and morbidity that have been experienced in Black, Latinx, and Indigenous individuals, which are unacceptable in a country that prides itself on the quality of its healthcare system. When adjusted for age, underrepresented minorities are two to three times more likely to be hospitalized and two times more likely to die from the disease than Asian or non-Hispanic white Americans. That disparity is not unique to COVID, of course, but reflects longstanding inequities in the provision of healthcare that has been documented for decades with few, if any, serious efforts to correct them. They also reflect the high prevalence of risk factors like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease in minority communities the cumulative effect of lifelong disparities in food security and quality, education, housing, and employment. The pandemic, the pandemic is, fingers crossed, a short-term crisis for us. Combating racism and its toxic residue will be much harder to achieve and is a long-term challenge for all of us. Closer to home, of course, this mirror also brings into sharp focus the longstanding underrepresentation of African Americans, Latinx, and Indigenous peoples in STEM, and the role that racism in all its unconscious forms has played in their exclusion. This is a difficult moment for the scientific community, as we have long believed in the objectivity of scientific truth. Science is the purest meritocracy and the fairness of our vaunted peer review system. Now, women have known for a long time that there are chinks in that armor of virtue, 
but it, is, it has been social scientists who have provided us with the hard evidence of the unconscious and implicit bias that permeates so much of what we do. With greater self-awareness of our human frailties, including what appears to be a deep-seated instinct to prefer those who resemble ourselves, a phenomenon called homophily by behavioral scientists, we can hope that the elusive progress that has stymied so many well-meaning programs designed to expand the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in science will finally be within our reach. Seeing the new and impressive commitments that many organizations and institutions are making to improving representation and importantly, belonging has been hardening. But let's face it, words are cheap. We will be held to account by future generations for what we actually do. Now, as I said, being a glass half full versus a glass half empty kind of gal, I have been thinking about the lessons we can take away from the pandemic and how those lessons may help to strengthen the scientific enterprise that Vannevar Bush set in motion. So one dramatic shift in the community over the course of the pandemic has been the embrace of what is broadly described as open science. The urgency of the moment, especially within the ranks of virologists, immunologists, and structural biologists who could immediately bring their expertise to bear on the virus and its impact on humans, led to an explosion in the use of preprints as a way to alert colleagues to progress in understanding the disease and its sequelae. The expanded use of preprints has been greatly assisted by a variety of funding agencies, such as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Wellcome Trust, the European Research Council, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiatives, and even the NIH, which have accepted preprints as legitimate evidence of productivity and grant applications. The NIH even created a pilot project to test how preprints could be searchable in PubMed. Over the last few years, many journals have adopted policies that allow authors to submit manuscripts for review that are posted at the same time on the archive, a critical concession if preprints are truly to become widely used in our community. Now, preprints are hardly a new idea. In fact, they've been around for 30 years in the physical sciences and were widely used within physics and astrophysics. It was assumed by many, including me, that they simply would not work in life sciences because of the significantly larger size and complexity of the various disciplines that make up our field. The first preprint server for life sciences was established in 2013. And as you can see from the slide, the number of preprints posted on a variety of archives grew slowly in the first few years. As the scientific community viewed with some skepticism the question of whether the manuscripts would be taken seriously or even read. The COVID-19 pandemic dramatically accelerated the rate of deposition of preprints into archives to the point that by April of 2021, 30% of all COVID-19 manuscripts were being uploaded onto archives. Of course, preprints are not without their challenges. In the absence of rigorous peer review, research reported in preprints can be poorly conducted, misleading, or even downright wrong. A notable example was a preprint that claimed that the SARS-CoV-2 genome had HIV insertions. That preprint was quickly withdrawn but not before it elicited conspiracy theories about the origin and nature of the virus. Furthermore, the prospect of keeping current with preprints, especially in large fields, can be daunting given the already crushing volume of the current peer review literature. So will this trend to freely disseminate research papers prior to peer review and their acceptance by journals be sustained after the pandemic? When the sense of urgency recedes in the rear view mirror, I certainly hope so, as this would be a lasting beneficial consequence of the pandemic. By reducing the power of the journals to hold research hostage through long and often unnecessarily contentious peer review, preprints not only speed up the process of publication, but it also democratizes science for those in parts of this country and around the world 
who do not have access to expensive journal subscriptions. Another completely unanticipated consequence of the pandemic has been to radically change who has access to information. It has been fascinating to watch Zoom, a love-hate object if ever there was one, transform the local weekly seminar at our institutions from events attended by those in immediate geographic proximity into global events attended by anyone with an internet connection. It has in many respects accelerated the dissemination of new knowledge. And I don't think the gears that the pandemic set in motion will be able to reverse themselves when this is over. Another unplanned and unintended consequence of the pandemic has been to accelerate national and international collaboration. Along with the assembly of new kinds of teams, as scientists dropped what they were doing, mobilized with their colleagues in their own institution as well as around the world, and pitched in to fight a common enemy, SARS-CoV-2. Some of the mobilization was directed at pressing public health needs. And I'll give you two examples. The Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard with critical leadership from Eric Lander and Stacey Abrams almost immediately converted one of its genomics research platforms to conduct COVID-19 PCR tests, initially for nursing homes in Massachusetts. But as the urgent needs for testing became apparent, they quickly expanded their capacity to cover vulnerable, underserved communities, and ultimately over 100 colleges and universities and K through 12 schools in the state. At one point, the Broad was conducting over 20% of all COVID tests in Massachusetts, and for a price that was significantly less than the testing companies were offering. In a different variation on this theme, Joe DeRisi and his colleagues at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco began working with local public health departments in California to help them set up their own testing and genome surveillance programs and to assist them with the sophisticated data analysis needed to do proper genome surveillance for SARS-CoV-2. I mentioned these two examples, not because they are unique, they are not, but simply because I happen to know them well. Now it's been rightfully pointed out that the Broad and the Biohub benefit from one critical advantage. They are both generously supported by philanthropy, by Eli and Edith Broad, and Mark and Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, respectively. The availability of unrestricted funds that could be mobilized in a crisis were essential to their responses, to be sure. Now, I recall 10 years ago doubting whether philanthropy would ever have a major impact on science, given the difference in scale between the annual budget of the NIH and the grant-making capacities of philanthropies worldwide. I now realize how wrong I was. The generation of great wealth over the last two decades, some would even say obscene wealth, has given philanthropists individually and through their many foundations, opportunities to invest in science that hopefully complements as opposed to duplicates what the federal funds are supporting. That I used to think philanthropy would, was not going to be able to have a major impact and realizing that I was wrong. So, as you can see in the slide, the generation of great wealth over the last two decades, some would say obscene wealth, has given philanthropists a lot of opportunity. So today, the gap between the declining fraction of research funded by the federal government, those are the dark blue bars in the bottom, um, that are coming from, that, that are federal funds are now almost equal to the what is coming from philanthropy, which is the combination of the gray and the light blue bar. So philanthropy is becoming a much greater uh, part of uh, uh, science funding today, and I think has had a tremendous impact during the pandemic. What we've seen during the pandemic are scientists with relevant experience dropping what they're doing, pitching in to answer the many, many questions about coronaviruses that need immediate answers their roots of infection, their impact on the human body, their zoonotic origins, and the response of the immune system, to name just a few. 
It has been inspiring to watch the community react so quickly in a global emergency and to forego their own work to, in favor of the collective good. This response has had a particularly strong impact on students and fellows who too often enter the field with their idealism on their sleeves and gradually become disillusioned by some of the less attractive features of our system that reward the individual to the exclusion of the team. To the degree that the pandemic has rekindled their enthusiasm and excitement for a career in science and for conceptualizing new ways to make contributions, not as individuals, but as parts of teams, the pandemic will have been brought about positive change. On the other hand, I don't think I need to tell this group that the pandemic has been especially hard on the career prospects of the youngest practitioners, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and investigators just beginning their independent careers. They are by far the most vulnerable victims of this terrible plague. Many found themselves without the possibility of continuing their experiments and losing both precious resources and momentum as a consequence. And others found themselves in limbo as universities, medical schools and research institutes shut down searches. It's critical that both the government and private funding agencies recognize the time that these young investigators have lost and compensate for those losses with flexible extensions of support. If ever we needed funding to be nimble and able to adjust to changing circumstances, it is now. My optimism that we will come out of this pandemic stronger, more diverse, and better prepared for the scientific challenges of the 21st century are also derived from the increasing number of scientists who are engaged in projects that are much bigger than anything a single lab could contribute alone. Let me highlight two examples. The National Human Genome Research Institute has recently announced a program to study the impact of genomic variation on gene function by creating highly collaborative teams whose goal is to generate a resource of variance and their impacts in the form of data tools, and models that will be shared with the broader scientific community. Likewise, the Human Cell Atlas is a bottoms-up initiative by Aviv Regev at Broad initially and Sarah Tigman at the Welcome Trust to build, as a community, single-cell gene expression maps of every cell in the human body. From the outset, its ethos has been global, open, and collaborative. It derives its support from multiple governmental agencies from the US, the UK, and Canada, as well as philanthropic organ, or organizations. I think this is a great trend. Let me conclude my remarks with an issue about the pandemic that has been brought into sharp relief, the erosion of public confidence in the ability of science to contribute to and help guide public policy today. The COVID-19 pandemic has made urgent the concern that many of us have had as we witness debates about the causes and consequence, consequences of global warming, the safety of genetically modified organisms, and vaccines such as the MMR vaccine, or the validity of the theory of natural selection and whether it should even be taught in schools. For the past two years, we have been in a public health catastrophe in which a significant fraction of Americans, roughly 23% of eligible adults are refusing to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide. Some of the reasons for refusing to take advantage of a life-saving and public health-saving medical intervention are simply a reflection of our hyper-polarized political culture. If Tony Fauci and Joe Biden are in favor of it, then I am against it, you hear. All of us, but especially scientists, need to be worried when scientific evidence is weighed no more heavily than uninformed opinions or beliefs. Or as former President Trump said at one point, I don't think science actually knows. But for others, particularly in the African-American community, the dark circles uh, in this uh, graph the failure to seek vaccination is drawn from a deep distrust of elites in general and the medical profession in particular. Their initial distrust of the science expressed most often by skepticism that a safe vaccine could have been produced in such a short time. 
derives from historical instances of mistreatment and neglect by the medical profession to be sure. But some fraction of that distrust comes from being unable to relate to who scientists are and what scientists do. As noted earlier, until we change that, minorities will be underserved by scientific advances. So the challenge to expand the public understanding of science is to contend with a paradox. The good news is that public opinion polls have consistently and over a long period of time reported general confidence in scientists as a profession and the use of public funds for research. A 2019 Pew Research Center survey found that Americans have a generally positive view of science and scientists and report a fair amount of confidence that scientists will act in the best interests of the public. This view is reinforced by a 2018 study by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences entitled Perceptions of Science in America. That study found that while attitudes are generally positive, they vary according to educational level, with adults without a high school diploma less likely than college graduates to view science as beneficial. Yet the picture is not that straightforward. For example, one, one's affinity group can outweigh the influence of education. Republicans, even with high educational attainment, are much more likely to deny that human activity plays a role in global warming. Another example, the initial anti-vax movement was ignited by one British doctor and a well-debunked report in a British medical journal, but it was taken up by educated women on the west coast of the US, ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Brooklyn, and believe it or not, chiropractors in Arizona. The politicization of science and public resistance to its discoveries are hardly new phenomena. They've been around at least since Galileo removed the earth from the center of the universe and Darwin and Wallace made monkeys of our ancestors. A common feature of such moments in history is the rapidity and shock of change and the difficulty in adjusting one's worldview to new insights from science. What feels different to me today is the powerful megaphone that social media has created both to spread and amplify anxiety or uncertainty, which can often begin as a legitimate concern, but can explode into conspiracy theory. A more insidious phenomenon is the purposeful dissemination of misinformation by bad actors with malice aforethought, a phenomenon that social media is struggling mightily to contain. The usual response of the scientists to misunderstanding or misinformation is to do what we do best, fall back on evidence, data, and argue our case in a clear and rational manner. But we're learning that this approach is more likely to dig someone's heels deeper into the ground than to change their minds. So I end with a plea that we come out of the COVID-19 cave, as we come out of the COVID-19 cave, we are stuck in. We must aim to more effectively engage with the people who support our work. We need to learn new ways to partner, and I use that word advisedly, with those who will benefit from our research. Some of the best examples that I have seen embrace that old adage, think globally, act locally. Clinical scientists are learning how to bring their patients into their work, to share with them their findings and ask their help in understanding the experiences of their diseases more deeply. As represented by the Count Me In program initiated by the Emerson Collective. Agricultural scientists in Minnesota have engaged local farmers by first asking them what they need to be more productive and then working side by side with them to solve those problems. Just before the pandemic, the Sabin Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group, which I co-chair with Harvey Feinberg, issued a report on vaccine hesitancy that found that the most effective way to persuade a hesitant mother to vaccinate her children is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a sympathetic nurse or pediatrician who is willing to listen to her concerns first. LeBron James and Tom Hanks are wonderful and inspiring role models, 
but their pronouncement don't move nervous mothers. And speaking of listening, we're going to need to, um, we are also going to need social and behavioral scientists to develop a greater understanding of how cultural experience and group identity shape trust in scientific research and how best to address skepticism of well-established scientific findings. We need to be smart. We need to find ways to use social media more effectively to counter misinformation about science. So there's a lot to do to get through these twin crises, not just intact, but with a scientific enterprise that is stronger, more inclusive, more open to sharing our science with each other and the public who make our science possible. And I'm very hopeful that we will get there. So once again, thank you for the great honor of this award and the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Shirley, for a great and inspirational talk about our current state of affairs. I see that some people have raised their hands, and I think we're going to start with David Katz. Go ahead, David. You're, you're muted, David. You're muted. you're muted. I said I was applauding, but I'm happy to ask a question, too. Um, so the American hey, everybody should know David Katz was a graduate student in my lab. Yeah, so it's a conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the American Cancer Society, when I was uh, chairing a study section, they have for all of their grants, they require um, a section where you describe, you know, what you think uh, you're going to do for community outreach, right? And I wonder, you know, what you feel about that. Should we have that at the NIH? Um, is it, is it everybody's responsibility to be doing this or some of us need to be holed up in the, in, in the lab and others can do it or what do you think? Yeah, I, uh, Dave, I, it's great to see you by the way and congratulations on your tenure. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I congratulated, congratulated you by email but this is great to be able to do it in person. Um, I, I don't actually believe that that it, that everyone should be uh, engaging with outreach. Um, to be quite frank, I think there's some who will be much more effective at it than others. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as as collectives, you know, whether we're talking about the GSA or we're talking about your home department or or even an institution, I th I think some uh, taking some responsibility uh, for ensuring that there is scientific outreach. I, th I think it's very effective when it's done, as I said, on a very local level. This is not something, you know, the poor national academies, and I suspect, Hugo, the Royal Society, have, have you know, tried to think of ways of doing this effectively as a top-down effort. And, you know, I certainly applaud those efforts, but I think at the end of the day, it is going to be most effective when people really take responsibility from the bottom up. Yeah, I would fully agree with that. And GSA is, is really engaging in this as well. And so there's other organizations that are doing this and going directly to minority schools and talking and asking, what you did, what you mentioned in your talk, the first question is, what is, what do you think? What is your concern? Why are you concerned? And yeah. instead of teaching, asking questions so that you have a feel as to why people are concerned, just like you did, you mentioned for the vaccinations of the children. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. The mothers. That's the most effective way of talking to people. And, and, and just to amplify a little bit on the example that I used out in Mon Minnesota, um, there were a lot of data that suggested, you know, deep hostility towards science among sort of rural areas of that state. And it was when the scientists went into the communities and, and really didn't say, we think you should do X because we're really smart and, and you're just dumb farmers, but said, tell us, tell us what your big problems are. And, and it, it has transformed the way in which those communities think about the value of the University of Minnesota, um, but science in general, so. I see a few other people raise their hands. Bruce, go ahead. Hi, Bruce. Uh, thanks, Hugo. Hi, Shirley, great to see you, lovely talk. Nice uh, to see you. I really enjoy your thoughts on these sorts of things. 
But my, my question is, when we talk about think globally, act locally, and we talk about one-on-one -on -one meetings being more powerful than PSAs, one-on-one -on -one meetings don't scale. Disinformation scales. Yeah. Um, and locally, uh, we have a problem in our society, what I'll call mosaic heterogeneity, right? I mean, my neighbors in La Jolla and yours in Princeton are a different group than the ones who are resistant to vaccines, Dif different from those who don't want to admit to certain levels of reality. So how do we, how do we reach out to those communities? Um, so, you know, I, I can go to local people in San Diego and they'll say, well, we know who you are because you're with our university. But how would I go to, say, Michigan or Wisconsin or, uh, you know, the part of Pennsylvania between the poles? So I, uh, you know, I, I have to really say that I'm not sure you can do that yourself, Bruce. Um, I think it has to be done, honestly, by, uh, you know, Penn State and by the University of Pittsburgh and uh, Stroudburg State College um, in the local communities because A, they understand those communities and B, they, they have a greater likelihood, quite honestly, of, of being able to gain the trust of the community. Having said that, however, I think what we can do sort of in, in a more organized way is provide uh, those institutions with the right set of tools and frankly with the resources to be able to do the work because the work you know is not expensive compared to some of the things all of us do um, but it could it oh but it's expensive in time absolutely and and you know one of the reasons I wanted to sort of talk just very briefly about the role that philanthropy is increasingly playing in our world is because I do not know a single solitary science philanthropy right now that has not um, got a program up right now in how to counter the misunderstanding and the misinformation about science. So they, they are laser focused on this issue. And I think what they can do with their resources is provide us with models and tools and money so that uh, we can really begin to mobilize. And this is where I think scientific societies could play an extraordinary role because you do have members everywhere, right? Your members are, are you know, in all of the, the, the red states that we worry about in this regard, you've got members, but, but what they often don't have- the Part of my concern is, is that those are the members who are most at risk professionally. And they have the least resources in money and time. Yeah. And that's why I think there is this, this role that philanthropy can play to help solve not all of those issues. I agree with you completely, but they can solve, they, they, they can catalyze. Oh, money can do a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing I, I, I mentioned very briefly, this vaccine hesitancy study that I did uh, with the um, Aspen Institute and the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And I'll tell you, one of the other conclusions that we came to in, in, in our report is that we have to get much smarter in using social media. Because a lot of what was happening in vaccine hesitancy and why it spread from this one little publication to become something that even before the pandemic was a truly problematic phenomenon. Is, is, is social media was the amplifier. And we have to get smarter in how to use social media effectively. Um, and I say that as someone who is not on social media. So <laughs> on principle, by the way, um, uh, but we have to figure it out um, because that's where a lot of the damage is being done. All right, that's the go to Rodney. Hi Rod. Hey, it's so nice seeing all these people I haven't seen in so long. Yes, great, great to hear you. And um, I, I'm I'm from the Midwest too, so I'm an optimist as well. Um, and I think that the glass is half full. And um, I think that you, what you said is just right on. But I, I'm going to press on a couple of points. Um, and a little bit of is it about dollars? And part of it is <clears throat> you you mentioned two really big projects that are quite interesting. But you also mentioned um, philanthropy. 
And what I'm worried about, and this is a genetic society, and model organisms are super important, and basic science is super important to this. Where does that, where does that conversation come, and how are we going to get those kinds of um, those kinds of people, especially I'm thinking about um, philanthropy, to really understand that basic science is really important as well. Yeah. Well, I have, uh, for an optimist, um, I have some good news. Um, so uh, about six or seven years ago, a group of uh, philanthropists um, led in part by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, by the way, I think this was very much something that uh, Bob Tejan uh, cared about. But Jim Simons, the Cavley Foundation, the, the um, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, formed something called the Science Philanthropy Alliance. And the reason I know so much about it is I'm a senior advisor to them. And it now has something like 40 uh, members which are some of them are brand new philanthropists trying just trying to figure out you know how do i support science some of them are you know people you know like the welcome trust and the gates foundation but all of them have made this commitment to funding basic science and and fundamental science and what this what this alliance does we just had a meeting in new york uh two days ago what this alliance is trying to do is help philanthropists a, understand the importance of fundamental research, and B, how to effectively mobilize their, their funds, which are extraordinary, so that it is, it is doing the most important fundamental research. And I, I don't know how much you know about the Simons Foundation and Jim Simons and the, the degree to which he is holding up physics and astrophysics and mathematics uh, research in this country. Um, but, but the goal here is, is to help um, both very well established as well as new philanthropists understand how to support basic science. So I, I couldn't agree with you more, Rod. It's, um, this is really critical. Um, and, you know, I, I've lived through the years that all of you have lived through where the NIH makes great speeches about how important fundamental research is. And then when you actually track where the dollars are going, um, it, it does not look as though their money is where their mouth is. Yeah, so it's something I'm worried about too, Shirley, thanks. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Anybody has another question, comment? I think this was a very important seminar because we rarely hear these seminars in a, you know, in a scientific society like GSA, we, we typically hear it talks that are really science focused and not policy focused. And I think uh, it, it's really to the core of the function of GSA. Uh, and, and one of it that I think is really important is the communication with the people in the field to make sure that people, lay people understand yeah. what genetics is about and why okay. it's important and how it is a core. And, and promoting the outreach to communities from every local school through, for example, graduate schools uh, and graduate students is, is one of the ways we try, we're gonna try to achieve this, have graduate students go to underprivileged communities and talk to them and ask the first question, what do you know about genetics? What is your concerns and where do you wanna go? Yeah. You know, what do you think and, and try to, instead of teach, ask questions first, use those questions to kind of provide an input. And I think that is really a, an important message that we should carry away because eventually that will benefit everybody. So Linda Syracusa, uh, an old friend, by the way, um, that's why this is so much fun, has a question. She said, more than 40 years ago, I recall you talking about women in science and how gender inequities had not changed in 20 plus years. Boy, that's depressing. Has the pandemic taken us even further backwards now with fewer women in science? If yes, how do we reverse this? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Linda is obviously identifying um, one of the the things that 
uh, I worry about most about the consequence of the pandemic uh, and in, in literally every profession, but there's no question in science. Uh, it has um, hit women harder and they're all their data now that really um, uh, have looked at what has happened to publications, women's publications over the last two years compared to the two years prior to that. This is serious. Um, uh, you know, as, as women were caught and spending time, having to spend time at home with small children or even <laughs> medium-sized children, um, uh, they, they, I think, have paid uh, a, a very serious price. And, and I think it's going to be really critical. I mentioned that the government agencies have to be sensitive to this. I think it's just as important the universities and research institutes where these women work have to be sensitive to the fact that the, the pandemic hit them in a different, um, in a very different way than it hit many uh, male practitioners. And Pam Malou, who was a graduate student at Princeton, uh, says there needs to be credit given to the folks who set aside their research time to do the necessary outreach. Yeah, I thought Pam, you were, you were going to say there needs to be credit given to people who had to stay home with children. Do you want to turn on your camera, Pam, and talk about? Where is she? Oh, there, you there she is. Hi, Hi how are you? Hi, it's really good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. Yeah. You know, I agree. Yeah, the women um, who had to decide between the lesser of two evils <laughs> and stay at home and be caretakers. For sure, they need to be given the credit or the leniency or reduced expectations. I guess everybody should just get a two-year two reset on all their clocks. And yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's been so hard to do work, like you said, with the restrictions uh, about even going into the lab or um, the vagaries of these uh, conference calls and things like that. It, it's been really hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it depends upon, I think, as Pam just alluded to, it, it depends upon the kind of science you do. You know, computational scientists have generally mm -hmm. found it easier to make their way through this pandemic than those who need benches, who need right. labs, who, who need to be physically in a specific space. So, so it's, it's these kinds of complexities uh, that that this is affecting different people in different ways that that our institutions must contend with um, as they think about you know how to support their their faculty students and staff. Yeah, it's very very challenging uh, going in to only do the most necessary, vaguely move things along experiments and. And the discontinuity, uh, and like you men mentioned, loss of momentum, uh, it just really messes with your brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 been a catastrophe. At, sure. at the NIH, they have actually informed study sections not to consider the effects of COVID. Wow. <laughs> so, so so I have been in conference calls, Dave, <laughs> with NIH leaders who claim that is not the case and claim that that uh, program officers are being told uh, absolutely to take this into account. So it it's you know <laughs> I'm not saying that 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 what you just said is not actually happening. I think it is happening. Um, uh, but it's it, it's <laughs> it, there it's amazing. It's, it's like the NIH uh, administrators who say, oh, no, we, our support for basic science has continued unabated. And then you look at the numbers and say, hmm, doesn't quite look that way. Um, so who, who knows? I agree. We wrote an article in genetics about this and showed that the model organism support over the years was just going down. Yeah. And it's a steady state. It's, a, it's, it's not significant from year to year, but you, you kind of see the trend over the years. Yeah. It's really steadily going down. And Ma's research 
in some areas going up and some areas going down. So it's more steady, but for the other model, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that there is a steady slow but not a decline. It's a study section problem. And I think that um, David's point is a study section problem because it's some study sections are gonna have people who aren't leaders and don't tell the people on the study section how to behave. Because if you don't have a, if you don't have a, the chair of a study section, I don't mean the chair, I mean the NIH person. If that person, the SRO or whatever they call them, if that person's not somebody who pushes and makes things more fair, then the study section starts going off in these directions and it's awful. Yeah, I think you're right, Rod. I think All right, on this note, we're gonna have to kind of end this conversation. It's all taped and you can, uh, everybody can listen on it on YouTube and it'll be posted. And Shirley, thank you very much for your advocacy. Uh, it's uh, really a nice example as to uh, how we need to tackle important questions and what to do. And I see people applauding you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.